Today we continue on in our series from 1 Peter. And hopefully this works. And the important question I want us to keep at the front of our minds today is, what are you afraid of? Now you'll understand soon why this picture is up here. Usually when we ask that question, what are you afraid of? We tend to think of phobias, specific things, things that we can pin down and explain easily, like I'm afraid of heights. My walking is not that great. Those who know me know that my balance, yeah, only sort of okay. What else would be a normal phobia? Spiders. Think about it. They have eight legs. They also have eight eyes. I think if you didn't have a phobia about spiders, you might be a bit strange. Even something like agoraphobia, which is a fear of crowds, seems quite logical. If you're at a football game and things get a bit crazy, you know it won't take much for the crowd to go crazy and your life will be in danger. In the verses today, we're looking at fear. Peter writes about fear, but he doesn't write about these sort of easy to explain phobias. Peter talks more about the fears that all people will have, but that we tend not to talk about. Fears that are natural to all humans. Fears about being too different from others, being threatened, or being alone. Now, I love reading. One of my favorite books, a book series, is Anne of Green Gables, written by L.M. Montgomery. And I'm not advising that you take advice from fictional characters, okay? Not normally. Even though Spider-Man's uncle, Ben, did speak truth when he said, with great power comes great responsibility. I did hear this, I did read this verse, not verse, this quote though, which I think speaks very clearly and directly about fear. Fear is the original sin. Almost all the evil in the world has its origin in the fact that someone is afraid of something. It is a cold, slimy serpent coiling about you. It is horrible to live with fear, and it is, of all things, degrading. Think about it. It makes sense, right? When someone steals, it's because they're afraid of hunger or afraid of not having that thing they feel they need to have. When someone evil harms someone else, it's usually because they are afraid of being harmed themselves. When you are in a new place, traveling, maybe you're in a new school or a new workplace, and for many of us, we've been in a new country before, it's scary. You feel afraid. And so you tend to get a bit grumpy, a bit, you know, rude, because it's scary. Even horrible things like soldiers in wars, that starts with fear, right? You're afraid that that other country is going to come into your space or take your resources or hurt your people. And war results in the death of many. Over the last 10 to 15 years, we've jumped leaps and bounds about brains. We've learned so much about them with machines like MRIs and CTs and EEGs, making studying the brain easier. And when people have studied the brain of children and teens, when they experience fear over long periods of time, they've noticed certain patterns. They notice an increased reactivity in the amygdala, a structure at the hub of the brain's fear processing circuit. And that translates into impulsivity, a heightened response to threat. The reward system of the brain, on the other hand, shows a blunted, less sensitive response. Other brain abnormalities seen consistently include a smaller hippocampus, structural differences in the insula, 
reduced grey matter in specific cortical regions and alterations in the corpus callosum. Now, unless you're a neuro neurologist or doctor or neurosurgeon, a lot of those words wouldn't have made sense. I agree with you. But what it shows us is that fear really affects people. And the result of many of those changes in the brain mean behavioural changes in people. Fear makes a big difference. Our bodies and our brains get changed by it. Peter, in chapter 2, has just been writing about different sorts of relationships. He's written about slaves and masters, husbands and wives. And he continues in this specificity about how they should behave. Not only that, but in each of the relationships he discusses, there's this common theme throughout. He tells them that they are to be different from the world around them. They as Christians, whether they are husband or wife, whether they are slave or master, are to look different from the world around them. Peter wants his readers to understand that they were to follow Jesus' example, not what was happening around them. They were to understand what was the most important thing for them to fear, not what was right in front of them, but rather God's perspective. Whether thinking about life surrounded by contemptuous outsiders or even in relation to other Christians, Peter encourages his readers to be motivated by God's perspective, which is much more long-term rather than by the immediate fears in front of them. Rather than being afraid of suffering, being afraid of pain, they were to actually look to God's judgment, his final justice, and his sovereign power. Not only that, but Peter tells his readers that unlike this world, where often we do see injustice, God will favour the righteous, and his judgment will be fair. And so Peter writes, do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing because to this you have been called so that you may inherit a blessing. They weren't to just react the same way the rest of the world was. And so when Peter takes time in these four verses to look at what might be making his readers afraid, it makes sense that he would address this issue, right? It makes sense too that a lot of the fears that he's talking about are not phobias. I mean, we've got bigger legs, we can run away from those spiders. But avoid all relationships and all people, much harder. Well, let's see what Peter says. He starts us off with, who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? And we ask the question again, what are you afraid of? I think many of us know pain, physical pain. We are afraid of getting hurt. We've heard many testimonies where people have turned to God because of physical pain, because of sickness. Peter's response is, but even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. Who is Peter talking about? Do not fear their threats. And how can we suffer and still be blessed? Now the fears that Peter is talking about, they are immediate and obvious physical harm. And some commentators will understand that Peter is speaking about our lives here on earth. They'll say, if you give more money to church, if you treat other people nicely, God will make sure things for you go well. Hmm. Well, the next verse kind of goes against that. Peter writes, do not fear their threats, do not be frightened, but in your hearts revere Christ as Lord. Apologies. Now, the fears that 
uh, maybe when Peter asks who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good, maybe he just means people on earth. God will make things comfortable. But the next verse tells us something different. Even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. It seems instead that Peter is talking about the final day of judgment. Not right now. God will reward all his faithful people, all his holy priests, for their faithfulness. So we know that Peter is not telling his readers that following Jesus will give you a plentiful, rich life right now. That following Jesus means you'll be comfortable and God will give you whatever you want. Another danger I thought when I read this verse was it might mean that we don't have to be so careful. Or maybe like when we were talking about uh, suffering in other countries, we should be inviting punishment. I don't think so. Peter gives us wisdom when he says, but in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. He's telling us what the real answer is. This is not about what's happening here on earth, but it's putting Jesus first. It's putting God's perspective on eternity and this world in the right place. Well, what about another fear? I think many of us, and we saw this in the lockdowns, are afraid of being alone. How many movies are there about the kid who was unpopular and unliked? Peter's response is, Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. Now, this isn't quite the answer that we were expecting, right? I thought he would have told us, given us a manual about how to be popular, make sure people do like you. But actually, the quote that we have a little bit before this reading, that we would have heard a few, a few weeks ago, gives us much more context. That quote says, they must turn from evil and do good. They, re they must seek peace and pursue it, for the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. Peter was actually quoting from the book of Isaiah. In this section, we had Israel split into two kingdoms. The north was threatening the south. And rather than responding in fear and distrust, King Ahaz trusted the prophet Isaiah. And more importantly, trusted God to deliver him. Not only that, but God's people were to put their priorities straight. They were to fear and trust in God rather than the big, scary leader of the northern kingdom. For us Christians in an increasingly less Christian world, just as true followers of Jesus, we aren't to seek human approval. We aren't to trust in human leaders only. We aren't to give into those humans because they're more powerful. Rather, we're to trust in God, seeing, same as King Ahaz. Isn't that why Peter gave us those new names way back in chapter 1? He was reminding us of our real worth, of where our real understanding of who we are comes from. We are God's treasured possessions. And so just as King Ahaz trusted in God to save his kingdom, we can do the same. And so the answer, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope you have, makes a bit more sense, right? I'm worried about not being popular. Well, remember who you are. Remember that it is God who is watching over you. And be ready to give that hope. Tell others about that hope. It doesn't mean that when you share the gospel with others, you're not allowed to make mistakes. It also doesn't mean that if you share about Jesus, your popularity will be guaranteed. All we have to do is look at Jesus to see what happened when we do share the gospel. But we will be working in God's kingdom not by human values. What else are we afraid of? I think this is a big one, especially when you become a parent. You're afraid of failing your loved ones. All of us belong to a family, 
to a culture, to a country. Sometimes those groups, those cultures that we seek approval from, they aren't going to line up with what God tells us to do. Going out on a Friday night for drinks with your workmates, so you're friendly and they like you, when you know you don't handle alcohol well, you sure God wants you to do that? How do we choose when we want to belong? I had a friend who, when he returned home to Malaysia, after becoming a Christian, his parents asked him to go and worship ancestors with them, and he had to say no. He was a Christian now, and he couldn't agree with their religion anymore. So the reality that Peter tells us is keep a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behaviour in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. You won't always be able to please everyone. And so we need to know, have a clear conscience and be, conscience and be ready with an answer. We need to know who we really are. And so Peter's direction to his readers isn't, make sure you appease your family all the time. It isn't directions or instructions on how to make sure everyone is happy. Rather, he assumes that by now in his letter, you know you must follow Jesus' commands. And so instead of telling his readers to appease those around them, he calls his readers to be above reproach so that others have no basis when they accuse a Christian of lying. My greatest fear should not be that my human parent will be ashamed of me, but that my heavenly parent will be ashamed of me. That's when I should be ashamed as well. If you're blessed enough to have a Christian mum and dad, hooray, but not all of us are. No matter what situation we find ourselves in, we will offend and disappoint someone. After all, Jesus disappointed plenty of people when he didn't come as an army commander or conquering king to then bring prosperity and victory to the nation of Israel. Instead, he followed God's plan. He died on a cross shamefully, and all of humanity was saved instead. All of humanity can have the Holy Spirit living in them. And there are going to be plenty of times when pleasing your boss means doing something you shouldn't be doing. Plenty of times when we cannot always please those around us and still remain faithful to Jesus. Again, all we have to do is look to Jesus' example. He couldn't please all of the religious leaders there. And he suffered for it. Thomas Schreiner tells us Peter was not promising then that believers should, sorry, should es could escape rejection and harm in this world. Suffering stalks the believer until this present evil age comes to an end. Instead, Peter assures believers that nothing can ultimately harm them if they continue to walk in God's paths, that the pain inflicted on them now is only temporary and that they will be vindicated by God on that last day. And so, the last verse from today's reading, for it is better if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. Let us know God's will, let us do good as he asks us to, and be ready to suffer. Again, we can look to Christ as the ultimate example of that. He did not follow the human plans to bring this great nation of Israel to power. Instead, he followed God's plans. Believers are not to fear the suffering unbelievers might administer to them. They are to trust in the Lord, believing that he will vindicate his own. Indeed, for it is better to do God's will. And so we're reminded of that. When Jesus says himself, I tell you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who will kill the body and after that can do no more. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him whom, after your body has been killed, 
has authority to throw you into he- hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. That's who we should fear. That's who we should be afraid of. And so as we go into the week, I want to ask you again, think carefully. What are you afraid of? Let's pray together. Father God, help us each to have the right perspective. Help us to value your uh, guidance and your perspective so that we are fearing the right things. Help us to be wise in a world where Christians don't always get to be in charge. Help us to honour you in all that we do. Amen.